I'm not sure how I can explain this any more clearly than it shows it here on the PowerPoint. A synthesis reaction is when you're combining two elements together. A plus B equals AB, or turns into AB. Decomposition is when B AB is taken apart into A plus B. When you show a, a um, yeah, not really, sorry. Gotta keep this where it needs to be. When A plus B equals AB would be like building a protein. When I mentioned a minute ago, ribosomes will bind amino acids together. You get a whole bunch of amino acids in a chain. That's the synthesis reaction. You're creating things by binding them together. The decomposition reaction would be when you're digesting a protein in your stomach and you're breaking the proteins apart, like your stomach acids is breaking down the um, steak that you ate or something along those lines. And so the large molecule is becoming a smaller molecule. All right, I don't understand why that keeps annoying me. <clears throat> All right, exchange reactions. These are unique, and we will see this a lot as we move through things like the Krebs cycle and respiratory function and our pH balance in our blood and such like this, where a molecule, you know, as you can see here, A and B are mixed together with C and D, but instead of becoming A, B, C, D, they the uh, B and the D switch places. So now you have A, D, and C, B. These types of reactions are, um, you know, for example, a combustion reaction. That that could be a that's an example of an exchange reaction, like when something burns. Um, when we are exhaling CO2, when we're inhaling oxygen, when we are producing urine, these are all exchange reactions that are taking place in our body. Reversible reactions, again, most of the reactions that we're going to deal with and see are reversible. Uh, you can take hydrogen and you can take oxygen, you can make water, and then you can split them back apart and make hydrogen and hydro um, hydroxyl. Like, it's just... It can be reversed. What goes in one direction can turn around and go the other direction, and that's how our body works. And uh, we'll, we'll see this as we go further in. All right, so electrolytes is another uh, term for ions. They, they are substances that our body needs that uses their ionic in nature. So they're mineral-based, uh, potassium, sodium, calcium, these are examples of electrolytes. They ionize in water and are necessary for the way our bodies functions. Why they threw that in there with the acids and bases, I don't know. Um, acids are anything that's releasing hydrogen in water. Um, I guess that's why they wanted to throw say that you know it's an electrolyte. It releases hydrogens in water because it's it's just a hydrogen ion. Um, acid. Uh, that's like HCl in our stomach. Our stomach is made of, is full of hydrogen chloride. Our body makes the hydrogen chloride. And when we add water to it, it separates the hydrogen and the chloride molecules and calms it down. That's why if you have an upset or um, an acidic stomach, sometimes water itself will um, relax it and relieve the discomfort, reducing that hydrogen. So uh, hydrogen chloride is an electrolyte that releases hydrogen and therefore it is an acid. A, a base is one that would absorb hydrogen. It would bind to hydrogen and remove it from the water. Uh, so here's some important numbers that you're going to need to remember. The midpoint of the pH scale is 7, yes, and anything below 7 is acidic and greater than 7 is considered alkaline or basic in a chemistry sense. But in the human body sense, the number that you want is, does anybody know? It is 7.4. Four. That is the normal pH of the body. However, we have a range, and that range is 7.35 to 7.45. That is not a big range. Anything this direction is considered basic or alkaline. It likes Ugg boots and pumpkin spice.
and this over here is acidic. The reason I'm really bringing this out here and said this is very important numbers for you to remember is oh, I didn't realize that was not that was cutting off the bottom of the screen. Um, slide that up. Hey, now you can see it. The all right. So the reason it is important is if in chemistry we call anything less than seven acidic but in the human body we call anything less than 7.35 acidic so 7.3 which would be in chemistry uh, basic is actually considered acidic in the body so that's a detail that you're going to want to uh, remember when we uh, as we move through when we start talking about acid base balances and such like that I don't know why this isn't erasing. Whatever. All right. Um, back to the PowerPoint for you. Boom. All right. So this gives us an example of the scale, the pH scale, and how it changes. I think it's interesting to note where you can see where blood falls, but then we can start to see where other things are. Pure water is actually acidic in ref reference to our body, which is a good thing. Um, be however, can be dangerous if we were to consume too much of it alone. Um, ocean water you can see but then we see baking soda and you probably remember in elementary school or middle school you mix baking soda with vinegar and it bubbles and fizzes and pops that is the reaction the neutralization reaction of the acid vinegar and the um, basic or the alkali baking soda mixing together and neutralizing each other the hydrogen and the um, hydroxyls are all binding you may remember hearing or you know from EMT school or hearing your mom talk about it or whatever that when somebody drinks a poison or certain poison you know sometimes people drink a cleaner or chemical they are told to drink milk but then other times they are told not to drink milk the reason is milk is a weak acid so if you drink too much of a chemical that is acidic in nature you want to dilute it and milk as a weak acid won't react like water might, but will help dilute it back. So if you have an extremely acidic stomach for some reason, like you, you drink too much uh, tomato juice or lemon juice or you know, something along those lines, the or you, you drink some firehouse, fire department coffee, not firehouse, not the brand, but you know, fire station coffee, acidic stuff, um, you'll, you'll need to balance that out with the milk and you mix a weak acid with that strong concentrated acid so that it doesn't react in your stomach. Whereas if an individual for some reason drank bleach or drank ammonia, something that's way over there to the right, uh, you know, 12, 13 pH on the pH scale, if you were to drink milk with that, because those are strong basics or highly concentrated basics, alkali substances, and you are mixing that with a, new, a uh, dilute uh, acid like milk, it would create a huge reaction in the stomach. Lots of gas would be produced and they would vomit and it would uh, not be pretty. So that's one of the big reasons why we think, okay, can I let this person drink milk or water? And while for some it's very recommended to drink it because it fixes a lot of the problem or but with others not recommended at all and the best way to confirm is to contact poison control whenever you have a question like that have 911 call it uh, call them if you're on a call is that a question so can i put that can i put that like that i think ian forgot his microphone again it's spoiled you saying yeah. yeah there we go all right, um, so contact poison control, have now one contact poison control if uh, you're on the job and they'll tell you, you know, keep track of the pH of the chemicals and be able to help you figure that out. But that's kind of where that comes from as to how not to um, create an acid-base reaction in the stomach.
Notice that fungi likes the more acidic environments, whereas bacteria like a more neutral environment. Um, this is one of the reasons why we worry about our blood pH and such. If it becomes too acidic, it becomes too optimal for bacteria to grow. They like that strong acid environment, or they like a more acidic environment. So uh, we have to be careful for that. All right, so that's kind of a basic uh, intro to some of these various chemical uh, um, reactions and concepts. We will see these again. I will refer back to that. Um, let me uh, let me back up through here and kind of try to not deep dive too much. So let me tell you what I think you really need to remember. All right, chemical bonds. What is ionic versus what is covalent? Ionic, they gain or lose electrons, and that's why I was showing it with like the sodium plus. It has lost an electron, calcium or chloride negative is gained an electron. So covalent bonds, they are sharing electrons. It's when the two molecules, the two atoms are actually sharing the electron. It's You could imagine that it's orbiting between the two of them or around the both of those molecules. Not truly, but... We'll, whatever um know those bonds understand what a polar molecule is some molecules have a more positively charged end some molecules have a more negatively charged end and the positive charged end on a polar molecule is or excuse me the polar end that, that charge is what will make it water soluble Water is a polar solvent, so any um, polar molecule will dissolve in it. If it's not polar, it won't dissolve, So, medic whether that's a medication or uh, something along those lines that we're dealing with. All right. Um, good, good. Um, all right, types of carbohydrates, you're going to hear monosaccharides, you're going to hear disaccharides, and you're going to hear polysaccharides. You will see those again. No glucose, uh, which is also known as dextrose. Also, no glycogen. Um, we will see more of glycogen, but no uh, those terms. Proteins, most abundant organic compound in our body. Um, what are their functions? Produce energy. Def, uh, defense as in uh, antibodies and hormone requirement hormone messengers they they have tons of different other um functions but those are their some of their most specific or excuse me most general lipids again not soluble in water and very uh, abundant in our body very common and this is where we build the structures of our cells. This is what we build the structures of our cells with, uh, various lipids, specifically phospholipids on the cells. But this is where we build a lot of our um, cells. Steroids are a form of lipid. They are not the same as a hormone. But um, Dyke may have confused you on that before. Hormones, they're protein. Steroids, they're a lipid. A DNA and RNA. We're going to talk a little bit more about DNA, but we in RNA, but we really don't get it heavily into it. We're not. Um, the most we'll talk about is when we get to like immunology and such, when we're uh, talking about the various types of viruses or something. Um, but as far as learning it, it you, you're not don't really worry about that too much. Um, Enzymes, big thing to remember about enzymes, a couple of things to remember about them. They catalyze reactions. They make it easier for the reaction to happen. That's what it means, catalyze, reducing the energy required. But the other thing that is super important to remember about enzymes is they can be denatured because they're a protein, they can be changed. And the two things that change uh, denature them most commonly in the body, there's lots of things that can do it, but the most common issues are heat and as pH. So if it becomes too acidic or too basic, or if it becomes too hot or too cold, um, heavy metals like mercury or lead or something can denature them as well. Uh, certain other chemicals can do the same thing. That's why you use chemical cleaners on um, like surfaces and all that. Alcohol, it denatures the bacteria, the protein structures around the bacteria or the virus to destroy it. Um, 
So protein, excuse me, enzymes are a protein that is needed to re reduce the energy, catalyze reactions, and they can easily be affected by temperature and pH. Synthesis, decomposition, exchange, and reversible. Those terms know what they mean. Be familiar with that concept because we will see these reactions over and over again. So be familiar with the name of those um, and what those terms mean. Seven point four or seven point three five to seven point four five. Definitely the pH number to have to remember, as you can see here. Blood pH running right about seven point five, right about the middle there, between seven and eight. All right, so kind of tried to point out again the big stuff that you have to remember from this section. Let's talk a little about cell physiology. All right, so a minute ago we talked about how. An organism is made up of organ systems, which are made up of organs, which are made up of tissues, and the tissues are made up of cells. So now we're going to talk about those cells in general and the structures that make up the cells. This is not, um, this discussion of cells is applicable to all types of cells. Now, a we'll see things like actin and myosin fibers in the cell, microfibrils is what they're called. There's going to be a whole lot more of those found in a muscle cell than in a um, a the cell on a uh, alveoli wall. Uh, we're going to see things like hemoglobin proteins within the molecule or within the cell. Um, they're going to have a whole lot of those in red blood cells, but not at, none in a uh, brain cell. We are going to see things like mitochondria and nucleus and such, where these may be very common in a neuron cell, a neuro cell, you know, a neurotransmitter, but you don't find them at all in a red blood cell. So there's going to be some variation. So this is a very general approach to cells. And there are some, I will explain how these things work together and then point out the various things that you have to remember and be, um, be familiar with. Um, to be perfectly honest, by the end of this course, I will have mentioned every single thing or discussed in some significance every single thing in that picture except the centrioles. Um, we re I really don't have to, this course does not deal with those, but in some way we'll talk about microtubules or microfilaments, or we'll see intermediate filaments, we'll talk about the Golgi apparatus, we'll see glycogen stores, we'll talk about ribosomes, uh, the nucleus, the nuclear material, we've already kind of mentioned that a little bit, the, R, uh, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, the mitochondria vacuoles, lysomes, and the plasma membrane, and then of course the cytoplasm that fills it all. We will mention those things and discuss those things in various ways throughout this course. So while those may not necessarily all be on your unit exam and may seem less relevant in general to EMS, there are aspects of all those that I will continue to bring up and therefore be familiar with those terms so you'll understand what I'm saying in the future. So let's talk about what these things do. All right, cytoplasm is everything inside the cell. This includes the organelles and all of it. However, um, the cytosol is the liquid that actually forms the cytoplasm. And here in this text, we're going to talk a lot about the cytoplasm in the cell and how fluid shifting in and out of those cells causes it to shrink and swell and what that means for the cell. The nucleus is kind of the genetic code. Like I like to think of this picture here as this giant industrial complex where you have all of these different um, things happening. Raw material is shipped into the cell and then the or in, into the industrial complex and finished product is then shipped back out of the industrial complex. So if that's the case, let's break it down and show what these different things do. Here in the nucleus, you could associate that with the headquarters office building. Within the headquarters office, you have all the instructions, all the blueprints of how to build the entire industrial complex, as well as every portion of um, the instructions to build every product that that complex could produce. So all of that information, all that data is going to be stored in the headquarters. Here in the um, rough endoplasmic reticulum, 
uh, directly associate or adjacent to the nucleus. And uh, if you'll see certain pictures, sometimes um, you can see how they practically touch each other. Remind me later, I'm not going to interrupt now, but remind me later, I have a photograph of a cell that I can show you that I think um, it just blew my mind when I saw it. All right, why is it called rough? Well, here you can see in the picture, you see all those little red dots? So you see the endoplasmic reticulum, it says, and it's got the line pointing over here. I know, I think I'm talking like you can see it, but you can't see my mouse. Uh, I've got to figure out how to change that. All right, so it says rough endoplasmic reticulum in the bottom left corner of the image. And then it's got the line pointing up to that folded thing. It looks like a bunch of... Um, looks like a maze essentially and it's got all those little red dots on it i think they're red i'm colorblind i don't know i think they're red um those are ribosomes and that's you you can see the other instructions on the or excuse me the other label in the top right corner of the image it said ribosomes points to them those ribosomes can be free floating in the cytosol or they can be attached to the uh rough endoplasmic reticulum why are they attached to it because the rough endoplasmic reticulum is the raw material storage building of the cell. That is where all of the basic amino acids and ions and such are necessary to build proteins, to build hormones, to whatever that cell um, or the steroid or whatever that cell is supposed to produce. That is where the raw material is stored. And so the ribosomes are like the little CNC machines, the little factory machines, you know, the robots, however you want to look at it, the assembly line. And they take the raw material out of the endoplasmic reticulum and put it together into the package. After it's um, completed, after it's the protein structure has been, or whatever it happens to be, once that con combination has been completed by the rough endoplasmic reticulum, by those ribosomes, it is the product is then shipped to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Here is where finishing details are done. You can imagine it's like quality control. Um, X, X things are removed, um, and essentially that piece that whatever it is, you know, that product is prepared to be uh, released from the cell. Once its preparation is complete, now we're assuming that this is something to be removed from the cell. This could, there, the structure could be building another ribosome to be able to make another cell. The structure could be building more um, plasma membrane, you know, strengthening, the, um, enlarging the wall of the cell. If it's a hormone or a steroid or something that's going to be transmitted out of the cell or released out of the cell, it will then go to the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus is kind of like the shipping department where um, incidentally, the wall, it'll kind of, you see, it looks like a bunch of pancakes all um, laid together there um, in the bottom right uh, side of the cell. It's kind of a green color to me, maybe orange, I don't know. Anyway, if you look close, you can see like a little dot. If, and again, this is in your textbook if you want to look, uh, let me pull up the which page if you haven't figured it out yet. It is on page 241. So if you look close to it, you can see how it's got like little balls coming off the end or that look kind of like the vacuoles. That Golgi apparatus is actually made of the same material as the cell membrane. The, um, it's a, a phospholipid bilayer, and it wraps around whatever that hormone or transmitter, neurotransmitter, or whatever it happens to be. It encases it, packages it up to ready to go, and then it shifts its way through the cytoplasm to the plasma membrane, to the edge of the cell. And on the, on the far left side, um, next to the mitochondria, you can kind of see where, um, right where it says plasma membrane, it kind of looks like a little indentation into the cell. It's like a ball forming. That's a lot like how it would be released. And that's a vacuole where it's moving towards the cell membrane and then will actually become part of the cell membrane and release that hormone, that product into the bloodstream or into the surrounding tissue so that it can bind to a signal. And that's like how a nerve cell, like if a nerve cell was trying to send a signal to your muscle, it would release that um, neurotransmitter, like acetylcholine, for example, 
out of the cell or epinephrine, whatever. So that's where that, um, that's how that gets released. So it doesn't get pumped out through a hose or something. It actually gets encased in a cell wall uh, membrane, brings to the edge of the membrane, becomes part of the membrane, and then releases it that way. In the same sense, that's how things are brought into the cell. Um, a white blood cell, for example, can bring an entire bacteria into a cell through phagocytosis. They can also bring other cells into them through phagocytosis where they wrap around it, creating a vacuole around it, and then they hold it within the cell the cytoplasm encased in that vac in that vacuole encased in that housing so that it can then be um, broken down without whatever is in there. If it's like a bacteria or something, it can be broken down without it damaging the inside of the cell. Now, we've talked about the endoplasmic reticulum, the nucleus, the Golgi apparatus, and I've talked about vacuoles and the plasma membrane. You see over, the, uh, you can see towards the top of the image, it says lysome or lysosome. Lysosomes are like your uh, hazmat guys of this of this uh, nuclear um, this industrial complex. Within lysosomes, really dangerous chemicals and like peroxides and such like that are stored so that they don't break down the proteins or the structures of the cell. But they're needed for breaking down uh, triglycerides or uh, bacteria or whatever else gets brought into the cell. So. When a vacuole with like a, let's say it's a white blood cell and you have a, um, and it uses phagocytosis to grab a hold of a bacteria and it brings it into the cell via a vacuole. Well, a lysosome will bind to that vacuole and they will become one container. And then all of the con uh, contents of the lysosome will break down what was inside the vacuole and then be re pulled back into the lysosome so that it can be released. So the now essentially digested contents can be released into the cell to be used to make more proteins used as um, ions or amino acids or whatever they happen to be and turned into energy turned into glucose um all right so it says microtubule towards the bottom right corner those are a cellular structure. Think of it kind of like the scaffolding that holds the tent up. They are what gives the uh, structure to the cell. And they're also for service pathways where um, the vacuoles can be pulled along. They actually have these little tiny proteins that use energy that drag the vacuoles through the cells um, using uh, ATP. And that's how things get transported across the cell. Now, um, the intermediate and microfilaments, we're going to see those when we get to looking at our muscle cells more. Um, though they can be present in all cells, they are present in much greater quantity in muscle cells. That's your actin and my myosin fibrils. That's what makes the, cell, the muscle cells contract. So we'll see those um, later on here. So questions before I move to the next you know, section on this, questions on the cell confusions. I would say the way I've explained that, that basic information, that's what you need to know. And you probably, somebody please tell me, what is the one structure of that cell I did not mention? The what? The Why didn't I mention the mitochondria? Because everybody already knows it's the powerhouse of the cell, right? It's the one thing we remember from high school science class or biology. Or maybe you just learned it on Instagram. I don't know. Yep. I didn't mention it because I forgot to, but it is the powerhouse of the cell and it's probably the most recognizable and commonly um, understood mito um, organelle within a cell. I will, we will be breaking it down more later when we get into the Krebs cycle and all that. So we'll talk more about the mitochondria. But that basic description of the different um, portions of the cell, the organelles that I just gave, 
that's what you need to be familiar with. The mitochondria produces energy, the ribosomes um, synth um, synthesize proteins, the Golgi apparatus ships stuff out, prepares to release things, um, the nucleus stores the uh, genetic code and information, that kind of stuff. Sure. more just confirmation on like the dena denaturization process just to attach a real world example to it okay and ph balance um recommended washing your hands with warm water and soap it's like the two effects to denaturize what you don't want hands okay so the warm water is actually not really warm enough to denature anything because if it was, it would burn your hand. Um, the warm water is increasing the activity, the molecule, molecular activity of the water, and therefore it can carry the soap more efficiently to grab a hold of the, um, the dirt and such on your hand that you need. Um, and the, so that's why it's recommended that it be warm. A good real world example of denaturation, denaturation would be an egg, okay? We've all cooked an egg, fried an egg before, right? A egg is almost exclusively protein. There are some cholesterols and, sh and fats and such in it, but it is heavy on the proteins. The albumin of the egg white is very much protein based. So when you cook it and it changes color, it goes from clear to a rubbery white. That is a denaturation or a denaturation of the proteins in the al of the albumin protein of the egg white. And what that is is let me see. Um, and this is not what you need to remember, but I will show you a couple of things so that you can understand what I'm talking about. I mentioned earlier that amino acids form together in um, long chain. I don't want to use that color. I want to use this. All right, so I mentioned earlier that amino acids form together into like long chains, and oftentimes you'll see them in the book described in like ball form like this. All right, that is the primary structure of a protein. But after that, you will get helixes where they spiral together, or you'll get what's called a pleated sheet where they uh, kind of do this zigzag pattern next to each other and they're all connecting together that way. And then you'll, and so these would be your secondary. So this is your first, your primary. So primary, secondary, and then you have your tertiary. And in the tertiary, your protein, instead of being a long line or a squiggly line or a zigzag, they, they will start these uh, zigzags, you know, will then fold back on themselves. Or they'll have a, an, a straight line or something like this and where they start folding around and twisting around each other and then this is so that's your tertiary uh structure and then the um the final structure is the quaternary and that's essentially where multiple proteins so you'll have protein one protein two protein three and protein four may all bind together into some kind of structure okay so that's how proteins are built. Like hemoglobin has four different protein structures to make a he four different proteins to make one hemoglobin structure. First, before I go any further, this stuff I'm drawing, this stuff I'm explaining will not be on your exam. You do not need to memorize this. This is what I want to explain for denaturation. These structures like in the tertiary and the secondary structures are held together through different ionic bonds and hydrogen bonds between the molecules that are in the proteins. And when you add heat, you change the way those bonds work. And so now, instead of this one being um, folded like this, it might be zigzagged and then uh, squiggled and then zigzagged again, 
but it now it's a long straight line instead of a folded up line like I showed the first time. When it does that, it can't do the job that it used to do. If it was an enzyme or something, it would no longer be able to do that job because the hydrogen bonds or the ionic bonds or the sulfur bonds that are holding this all together will all be lost. If you were to add a uh, acid, like a pH or a base to it, it would start pulling away some of those hydrogen ions or those um, other salts or what um, salt bridges and such and breaking them apart, resulting in the exact same uh, chain and the same types of change. So you can actually cook an egg by putting it in vinegar. You know, that, that would denature the proteins of the egg as well and cook it. Um, if you ever spend enough time on Facebook, you probably saw somebody share a video about, look, I pour, put a steak in Tupperware and then I poured a Coke on it, you know, Coca-Cola on it, and it cooked the steak, it cooked the meat. You know, what do you think Coke does in your stomach? And it's like, you guys do realize that the pH of Coke is something like five. And the hydrochloric acid in your stomach has a pH of like 1.5. Like the stuff in your stomach is far more acidic than a Coke could be. Um, but that's what the Coke or the hydrochloric acid or the vinegar or the high temperatures are doing to the proteins. They are changing their structure so they can no longer do their previous job. Does that answer your question? Kind of give you a real world example? Okay. I like how that one guy at Roswell takes a drink of his Coke every time I'd mention Coke. <laughs> and he always holds it up as if it's got rum in it or something. Somebody sniffed that bottle for me. Oh, I thought that was the Adderall. <laughs> Which, uh, if you got some, um, can you hook me up? <laughs> supposed to be an example for us, sir. Yeah, that's why I'm going to school. <laughs> <laughs> my meeting this morning was my fourth chemistry exam of the semester. <laughs> now, I did make aspirin. We did synthesize aspirin in the lab earlier this semester, so that was cool. <clears throat> No, I'm, I mean, I'm in, I'm in meth country, but uh, I try to stay out of those uh, circles around here. All right, so let's see. We've talked about all these pieces and parts of the cell. <clears throat> Went through this. Okay, um, let's see. Is there, it doesn't show the other picture of the cell membrane. Well, daggum. All right, check out page 241. In your textbook, look at page 241. It's talking about the cell membrane. And you can see how they look like a bunch of little alien worms. They got a round ball head with, hey, I told you to look at page 241. You're still looking at me. Um, they got those little round ball heads and they got the little tails coming off the bottom of them. Those are your phospholipids. They are like a fatty acid that has a phosphorus head Phosphorus as an ion is polar, just like water, but the lipid or the fatty acid tails, they're not. They're not polar and they won't bind to water. So the head is called hydrophilic. It likes water, hydrophilic. But the tail is hydrophobic. It doesn't like water and repels water. But like always seeks out like. So the tails of the phospholipid bilayer will point towards each other because the fatty acid tails like each other. They'll bind, they'll connect, they'll be attracted. Whereas the polar heads will point out because they don't like each other and they will um, seek other attractions. So water, so like a cell can be dissolved in water, can be suspended in water, because water will form around it and form um, basic attractions, polar attractions to the membrane, but the water can't get through the membrane because of the lipid, the fatty acid tails on the middle won't allow the water molecules to pass through. So in that picture, you can see um, 
Well, you see those big structures that pass through it. I can't tell if they're pink or purple, uh, whatever they are. So I don't want to say it wrong. It's, they're, they're pink or purple, whatever. Somebody wants to correct me. Yeah, or maybe they're both. I don't know. Um, those represent proteins that are built into the pro uh, the um, cell membrane, and they can be in the form of channels, of receptors, and things like that. And some of those channels are capable of pumping like sodium or potassium ions or calcium ions in and out of the cell. And when they do that water goes with them through those channels. So the only way for water to get into the cell is through those protein structures, through those protein channels. Does that, does that follow? So yeah, it doesn't show it in the, uh, the PowerPoint, but I wanted to point that out in the um, textbook. And that's where the permeable... Uh, versus semi-permeable as to whether those channels are open or closed as to whether water can get through it. You're gonna hear me talk a lot about receptor sites. They are proteins, they are on the surface of the cells. They are activated by hormones or medications or neurotransmitters or uh, steroids and such. So these, um, we'll, we'll discuss those quite a bit. Um, through, as we go through this course. Identifier proteins, um, that's every cell in your body is supposed to have um, the same type of identifier protein on it that says this is your cell. That way your body doesn't attack it. Autoimmune disorders take place when those, when either, generally when your um, immune system gets typed to the identifier proteins on that tissue. Now, uh, fortunately, autoimmune diseases don't attack our entire body. They are generally isolated to a specific um, tissue type. For example, uh, multiple sclerosis attaches the myelin sheath around axons and interrupting uh, nerve signal transmission. Uh, Crohn's um, attacks the lining of our intestines. Um, result uh, is an autoimmune issue. Rheumatoid arthritis attach, attacks the um, cartilage and tissue in our joints uh, th with inflammation. So these are different uh, autoimmune diseases where our body's immune system is, you know, our white blood cells are attacking our own tissue because of a confusion in those identifier proteins. This is the same reason a person who's had an organ transplant has to be on immune suppressors for the rest of their life because the organ that they received, you know, they got a new liver, a new heart or whatever, came from another human. Even though it's very similar genetically, it is not exact. And so those identifier proteins are gonna be different, resulting in their body wanting to destroy it as an invader. Um, there's some really cool technology coming out right now with um, and being experimented with for the tr uh, dealing with these um, types of issues for organ transplant uh, patients. Um, won't get into it now. Ask me about it later if you want to, man. This, there's some crazy stuff. Or just Google it. Like, there's some really crazy stuff out there. Like, crazy cool. All right. Talked about cytoplasm. Talked about all the organelles. The only one I really didn't mention from here is the centrioles. Centrioles are uh, play a big role in the division of, in cellular division. Um, they're also inside a um, sperm cell. They are what powers the motility of the flagella. The flagella is that long tail-like structure coming off the end of a sperm cell, and the centrioles are what gives that uh, power. That's the, they control that. Um, this mentions flagella, I just explained that. Cilia is another structure that was not shown in the video. Cilia is gonna be found in a lot of the mucous membranes of our body. It is not a hair, but it is a hair-like structure. The reason we say it's not a hair is hair is made up of cells. We are talking about a hair-like structure on the surface of a cell, so much, much, much smaller than a cell. We're all familiar with our nose hair and how our nose has all these fuzzies coming out of it that we're trying to pluck because they get in the way and cause us to sneeze. Well, the further down our 
airway, the further down our respiratory tract we go, the smaller those hairs get until they're no longer hair and now they're cilia that are on the surface of our cell. We'll see some pictures of those in respiratory, um, but they play a big role in the movement of crud out of our lungs and in the capturing of um, bacteria and dust and things like that. All right, we talked about the nucleus. Do not read this section of the book. There is no reason for you to get worried about the life cycle of a cell, intraphase, um, cell division, differentiation, um, meiosis, um, mitosis, uh, cytokinesis. Yeah, this stuff... I'll mention possibly when we get into like trauma, we're talking about tissue healing. We'll talk a little bit about the um, mitosis, but that that's about, I mean, we're just gonna men discuss that this is where it exists. This is a good example of where it happens. Other than that, it's really not relevant to what we're talking about here. So this part, yeah, we're just gonna move through here. Really cool. Again, I could nerd out forever, but we don't need to. So moving on. All right. Uh, I'll mention this. I'll point this out because I brought up the, the organ transplant thing. Stem cells. Stem cells are base cells for our body. They essentially have all of the genetic code and could become any cell in our body at all. All they need to do is be differentiated based on the hormones or chemicals present into a brain cell or a heart muscle cell or a skeletal muscle cell or a bone cell or a GI tract cell or whatever it happens to be. And these errors in differentiation are where some people end up with um, strange organ structures in odd, in odd places on their body because the cells got differentiated incorrectly. Stem cells are very prominent in fetal develop, during fetal development, and they are extremely concentrated in fetal, um, excuse me, in umbilical cord blood and the Wortmann's jelly, which is that clear gel-like substance inside the umbilical cord. It's just full of stem cells. Stem cells can be replicated. They can be put into a in vitro, in a glass, in a test tube environment that has the right amount of nutrients, and they can be multiplied but then be differentiated to whatever tissue they need. They now have the technology to regrow organs for you if they had your stem cells. Now, the only way you don't have stem cells in you anymore because all your tissue is differentiated. To my knowledge, they have not successfully regrown nerve tissue with stem cells, but I know that's, an that's something they're trying to figure out. Um, one of the most interesting things with heart transplants is they have the ability to bring, to build the, um, essentially a skeletal structure of the heart through the um, non-typed protein membranes that are kind of like a plasma structure. That's, it's not the plasma membrane, but it's not typed like they're with uh, identifier proteins like I mentioned before that then they can infuse it with stem cells and then stem cells can be t um, typed around it where they can grow. The, they're basically figuring out how to be able to grow the entire organ, grow a heart, and it would be your heart. It would be your DNA. It would be your uh, identifier protein. So there wouldn't be any concern about your body rejecting it. Um, this is one reason they encourage cord blood banking with kids uh, with um, families that are having kids now is if you can put the cord blood um, away in the freezer and that kid, let's say they develop diabetes down the road, type 1 diabetes, they could um, essentially regrow that part of the pancreas that's necessary for production of insulin so that you wouldn't have to be stuck on insulin for the rest of your life. Um, they can use the stem cells from one child to help other children in the family or even the parent, although the further away you get genetically, the less specific um, and uh, the uh, treatment can be. But those are some of the things with stem cells. Um, all right, so cell signaling. We'll discuss cell signaling more when we're talking about the, humo uh, the immune system. Um, this 
plays a big role in T-cell and viral infections and such like that, but they can also play a role in like requesting more oxygen or removal of CO2, uh, things like that. Um, requesting um, other functions to happen. All right, so that kind of gets through cell structure and all that and heads into a new section talking about cellular respiration and then we're going to get hmm, yeah and then we talk about body fluid composition looking forward here a little bit um all right, go ahead, take a quick break before we get into this stuff. This stuff is going to be really important in this next section. It's going to be a little deeper. Um, so go ahead, take a quick break before we get to it. <laughs> 